questions to start? No? Easy group. The second day is always easier. Everybody's just like, yep, just give me the information. Okay, so I'm going to introduce, uh, oh, actually, we thought it would be good. I was talking to Jolie, or Joelle, and um, we thought it might be interesting because we're at a small group just to take a few minutes to go around the room to see who's here um, and where you're coming from so that the presenters uh, may be able to spend a little more time on some areas and not on others depending on uh, the needs of the group. So uh, maybe we'll just start with the presenters and then. I'm Carolyn Doris from the Peterborough County City Health Unit, and I'm a public health nutritionist uh, working in new to the food security area. I'm a Joie Fautou and I work at the YWC Peterborough and I do primarily community building work that focuses on food security and social inclusion. Okay. I'm Heather Toma and I'm from the Tank Health Center. Um, I'm working with food programs there, community food programs, and I'm also an organic farmer. I'm in the of working with larger food system questions and products. I'm Heather Noble Volpe, and I work at the Region of Peel Health Unit, Community Development Work, and uh, not currently doing anything with food, but I'm okay. here because I'm interested in that. Great, perfect. I'm Joan, I work for uh, Wabashi First Nation Health Clinic. I'm the community gardener, okay. uh, in a community kitchen, bringing mental health therapy through the garden, um, with obesity and diabetes childhood. Prevention. Good. Um, yeah. Perfect. I'm Celeste J. Clou with the West Memphis Community Health Center. Uh, we are in the process of setting up a day away center for seniors and we're looking at some community cooking. And we're also in the process of um, setting up a good food box program. Great. Right. Uh, yeah. We're just doing introductions. No yeah. pressure. You walk in, you're like, I. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm Kelly Henderson. I'm the health promoter at the Chickamauga Community Health Center up in Midland. Good. We serve Aboriginal, Francophone, and Anglophone communities. We've got a community garden. Awesome. That's kind of the end of the plan. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully after today, we'll uh, give you some that, was, that was the planning document. So yeah. I'm like, okay. Okay. I think, I think maybe we need to kind of figure out what we want to do with this community garden. Yeah. Good. We're in collaboration with the Midland Community Garden, so it's sort of another body that okay. runs it. So we, I want to figure out how we can do the partnering. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Let's go to the back. I'm Sunday Harrison. I work in a nonprofit in Toronto doing school gardens. I'm also affiliated with um, the Ontario Edible Education Network, which is working to build out the, um, a bunch of um, you know policy platforms around healthy eating and uh, from the farm, healthy farming through the food system. And my work is specifically with schools. Good. Uh, my name is Janelle Andrews.
dietitian. <laughs> She is paying attention. Monsieur? Well, Name, uh, where are you coming from? Your perspective? It's in interested French in French or... Oh, whatever you want. Everybody so far has done it in English, but... Je m'appelle Jean. Je suis à Jean. Pour l'expo qui est un monde de développement francophone. On s'en fait en service social. Bon. Okay. Oh, oh. We're stuck in another one. I missed one. Please. My name is which has been um, uh, not an overnight recipe. It's taken a lot of shopping around of our community to pull the ingredients together. Um, but we think we have the start of our really good base of what we want to cook up in our community around uh, uh, food security and, um, uh, and community development and, and making an impact on our food system. Yeah, no, one the other. I wanted to get them both up. Okay. And <coughs> perfect. Okay. There we go. Okay. And we've had a long, I would say, our, our, our organization is the YWCA of Peterborough, Victoria, and Halliburton, and the Peterborough County City Health Unit. We've been really fortunate to have a, had a long relationship of working together, which uh, has certainly been, I would like to think, mutually, mutually beneficial. And since Joelle is still uh, uh, <laughs> supporting and working together, I think that that, that speaks uh, to, to a piece. And, and certainly with public health, because we're tied to public health standards, there's only so much we can do and with budgets. And that's where it's been amazing to have community partners that uh, have a little more leeway and can <laughs> tap into different funding and and at the end of the day though we're all working together for the same piece so um, in Peterborough we uh, we this is the definition we use for food security um, that all people at all times have physical and economic access to nutritious safe personally and culturally appropriate foods um, and we've also added in which is that sort of the typical definition but locally um, we've also uh, added through our community food network, these other two components that, that we're looking at food that's produced in a, in a environmentally sound, socially just um, way, and that we're promoting community self-reliance, which is certainly easier to say than do, but is something that at least as a goal we have. And, that, and I think the critical piece for us is that when we look about food and our food programs, and we do have a lot of food programs in our community, that we're looking at things that really promote human dignity at the end of the day. Um, and that we try to weave that in through all of our programming um, and breaking down barriers and making programs accessible um, and, that, uh, and that we're just being respectful. Okay. So, so certainly um, from the public health standpoint and certainly I think from a lot of the community health, many of you, the, the whole idea around food insecurity and the social determinants of health. And that's really where um, you know, we really see food security as really just the mere tip of the iceberg in the work that we're doing. And that in fact, um, 
you know, it's the social and economic challenges, it's uh, uh, affordable <coughs> housing, it's that all those things that lead together are bringing our vulnerable communities those most at risk. Um, and that the, you know, certainly it's complex, the solutions aren't easy, and there's many different types of policy decisions and programming opportunities that we can work together to look at the bottom part of the iceberg so that we at the end um, impact food insecurity and start to make a difference uh, around going back to our, uh, our community where food is available for all and there's dignity um, at the end of the day. So, as a public health nutritionist, certainly uh, the Nutritious Food Basket, which is a protocol through our uh, public health standards, is certainly one of the key pieces that we see around um, uh, looking at the supports and what does it mean around food insecurity. And that bottom line for us, that, it, that really we know limited incomes are the issue in our community, that with, when taking into account housing costs and the cost of our nutritious food basket, which we price yearly, that when you look here, a, a single man on Ontario works, um, if he was to buy that nutritious diet according to the nutritious food basket, uh, he would be in the hole $214 every month. So at the end of the day, people don't have the choice to buy nutritious, healthy foods. And when we look at, at you know, the impacts, then that that's where we're really back to our food security and that if we want people to be healthy, uh, we really need to be looking at policies and supports and mechanisms in our community that can make a difference. Um, and certainly we know, and all of you have, that have talked about your involvement with food security, it's those pieces that if you can't afford to eat a nutritious diet, you're not eating fruits and vegetables, you're not eating lower fat milk and alter alternates, um, you're, you're making those choices. And, and this is you know, the, the negative picture that we've got, that's certainly even before we look at uh, other costs uh, like transportation and whatnot that we know are, are also rising costs in our community as well. So certainly those living on social assistance in our community we know are particularly vulnerable and that's why we've, we've come together for a long history of working together to try to make a difference. Um, and it is a, a long road but we think we, we are making a difference and that's why we, uh, our partnership stands strong and continues to work. So in Peterborough, we, our medical officer of health then you know, food security has had, or I guess poverty has had quite a bit of work and a lot of public interest, um, particularly two municipal elections ago where we had a, a, a candidate for mayor in our city that said poverty is going to be the issue that I'm going to address if I'm elected. Um, unfortunately, she was not elected but does remain very passionate. But the opposing mayor, mayoral candidate, um, stole her, well I shouldn't say stole, uh, adopted her platform and so um, at that point then we actually had in the city of Peterborough a mayor's task force on poverty which then grew out into a Peterborough poverty reduction network um, that has groups and community partners looking at, at poverty um, and and its impacts so there's um, Jeanelle might have to help me there's a housing group there's a basic needs group there's a uh, an income group and then the community food network was uh, initiated as a way to bring all the partners around food um, food programming access to food healthy food together uh, as a lens and a, as a, a group to talk about policies and to look at um, at next steps we're probably not exactly a food policy council yet but maybe we're we're getting a little bit more that direction but certainly a, an opportunity to bring together so uh, as part of the, uh, the, the CFN, the Community Food Network, we've adopted um, our food security continuum and have really tried to focus our meetings and the work in our community to bring the groups together so that we're focusing on the short-term relief, the emergency food, which we call need food. Um, and this is actually the sort of snapshot of our website. And if you're interested, you can go through the health unit at www pcchu.ca and there's a link to food in Peterborough right there um, and when you click if you were to click on the empty bowl in need food you'd then be able to see a whole listing of, of the amazing programs that people are running in Peterborough to try to make a difference for those that are needing food today so not only do we list um, our food banks uh, we have a, a regional uh, it's called Kortha food share that is a warehouse for all of our food banks and they do uh, um, look after food donations and member agency food banks then are coordinate through that group but uh, we have a, a really active faith community that's done a lot and, and just a, a community that's done a lot around community meals so right now 
three times a day, every day of the week, except Sunday, um, people in need can come together for a community meal, um, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, um, in different areas throughout our city. Right. Um, and, uh, and again, that's through that need food piece. And in that website section, you'll also see where we've done some mapping with our county and city GIS departments so that we can actually look at food programs that are about, um, about needing food. So whether it's a, a food box drop-off site, our Just Food Box program, or if it's a school breakfast program for families that want to make sure that there's a breakfast program in their children's school that they can access food, where community meals are happening, um, even where a grocery store is, that's all. We've done that by all of our municipal, our, our eight townships and, and, uh, and also the city. Um, so, and then with the building capacity, the getting involved piece, which we talk about, that's where we're really looking at those capacities to build individual skills um, around healthy cooking and, and opportunities for growing food. And again, we've, we've got some strong partnerships there. Um, certainly as a, a health unit person, we like to think of our, our we have a long-standing um, collective kitchen program. Um, we, along with uh, community partners, support uh, a Peterborough Community Garden Network, which is growing uh, like wildfire or maybe like kale. <laughs> uh, Joelle is our kale fan in the crowd. <laughs> um, but right now, uh, like it's upwards of 30 gardens happening. Yeah, 26 in the city and seven in the county. And seven in the county. Wow. So we've had a, a, a lot of interest and support, so which has been great. But um, so in that, that get involved piece, really looking at those capacity building things that will be making a difference for our community. And then in the system change, that create change piece that we talk about as well, um, is really where we're looking at the policy piece and, uh, and next steps. And I think you know, one of the pieces which we'll be focusing on what we're talking about next that we were really excited about. In, in 2011, um, the city of Peterborough began their open consultation for their official plan, which was uh, called Planet Peterborough, which was a, uh, you know, a, a they really tried hard to engage the whole community, the whole city, about the official plan with presentations and consultations and whatnot. Um, and uh, so this, the Community Food Network took that opportunity to develop a, a Plant It document, which looked at the official plan from a food lens and a food security lens and made recommendations to the city of Peterborough around how food could be central to the official plan. And uh, I think that has been a real leveraging point for our community food network and the programming that we do, that, that we're really moving towards that system change piece and, um, um, and looking at the preservation of farmland, urban agriculture, uh, supporting, uh, supporting and looking at food policies that, that support everyone. Um, and one of those pieces that, that we were able to get into the official plan in its draft format right now was a downtown food hub center that would bring um, people together around our, around uh, food security. So that's what we're going to talk about today. <coughs> um, but I just wanted to show as well that when, uh, when, with the, when the Community Food Network came together, uh, we realized how complicated our system is and how many partners are working in food and it really is a, a hot topic. So, I know this is a little hard to see, but, um, and this is a little dated that it was 2011 and our Community Food Network has identified that, you know, in two years, a lot of the players have, have changed. But when we looked at food programs and uh, interest in a food hub or a community food center and community members working in food, we were able to, to break down, um, you know, the, the groups by um, agriculture and growing food and the different groups that are involved in that. And, that. and we have the benefit in Peterborough of having a rural community that's actually growing food too. Um, looking at education and groups within education that are looking at, again, at uh, food and food policy and food security. Uh, then we have our, uh, our health organizations, including groups like um, the, our health unit. Uh, and again, um, looking at you know, the connectivity and the types of programming that we're supporting that fit into the other pieces. And then community organizations, which is really the biggest part of our wheel there, which again, we're, we're very fortunate that, that so many people were excited about food in our community um, and, uh, and looking at you know, where we can we 
bring these groups back together? How can we knock down maybe some of those segregations and, and work together as a community food network? And that's where our project, Nourish, comes into play. <laughs> Which I will have to show up. Thank you. Um, juste avant de, de commencer, je voulais dire que je vais faire la présentation en anglais, mais vous pourrez me poser des questions en français après, si, ça, uh, so, si vous voulez. Um, so, Caroline really has given you a bit of an overview, uh, the kind of the, the context in which this project um, started. I think it was in uh, late 2008, early 2009. Um, so Karen mentioned that uh, we have this community food network. Some members of the network um, uh, decided to go to come to, to Toronto and visit the stop. Some I don't know if most of you are familiar with the stop. Um, we were already interested in trying to explore how we could push the needle a little bit more around food security in our region. So we were trying to imagine what could we do, how could we engage more people, how could we make more of a difference. So we came here and uh, took a look at what was happening at the stop and came back to Pinabor and thought, yes, we really want some of the ideas that are presented in the stop. But um, people who are involved in food security work around uh, rural communities will know that most food security initiatives grew out of metropolitan centers. Um, and so when then you go to, I don't know if you know our region much, but it's basically um, uh, urban and rural regions, half-half. So what do you do then in a region like that? Because uh, while we really like you know, the stock model, we know we are not Toronto. You know? um, so we started to get together and uh, to talk about what could we do? Uh, but we wanted, uh, we knew we wanted growing, cooking, eating, um, building communities through food. We knew that that was the key to what we wanted to do. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the key ingredients to this project. Uh, and right from the, th the start, actually even before we came to uh, visit the stop, we knew we wanted to find uh, a model that could be uh, speaking to both our uh, urban and rural uh, component. So that was really important because all the stories that we were gathering around food security spoke about how much uh, people in the rural communities are isolated. Um, and access to food um, is also really challenging in those areas. Um, and transportation, I mean, every time we talk about an issue in the county, the issue of transportation is key. So, you know, so what could we do to try to find a way to, to address those pieces? Um, and we spend quite a bit of time uh, exploring that. And I'll, I'll tell you later on uh, how we came, well, what we are thinking of doing. But what we liked really uh, very much about the stop were the three pillars that are built into the stop model and um, since then into the community food center model. So it's the idea of first you have to make sure you have access to healthy food. Without that, nothing is going to happen. Um, but once you have access to a healthy food, what do you do with it? So we knew that food skills were really important to build into the system, both in terms of growing food and in terms of cooking food. So that was a sec that's the second pillar. But um, if you've been to a collective kitchen, for instance, you know that so people are cooking together, eating together, and very quickly what ends up happening is that stories about food start to come up. You know, so uh, what we also are building into the system, the third pillar, is uh, out of you know, the access to healthy food, the food skills, and then we move into advocacy. Advocacy both in terms of anti-poverty and advocacy in terms of food and the food system in general. So those three pillars are at the heart uh, of our model. Um, but we also have been talking about um, one of our partners called Peter Eats, which has a cafe in the uh, public library. And what they are doing is they're building employment skills for people uh, who, are, uh, who have barriers to employment. So we also wanted to integrate that into the model. And then 
there's a lot of discussion uh, in our region around distribution. And so we, we also want to see how can we build this into our role model. And finally, we really feel that food builds community. And so how can we find a way to engage the whole community uh, around this particular project? So um, what has clearly been working for us uh, with this project, but also since um, Carolyn was talking about it's been a long partnership. We know that if we want this work to work, we have to go, we have to start with where the community is at. So community development work is the basis of our approach. So um, we know that, for instance, in terms of the work that we're doing in the city, it may not be the work that works for the county. So for instance, in the spring, we did a series of roundtable conversations you know, throughout the, the townships and said, okay, so what, we brought together our stakeholders uh, around food and said, you know, what would you like to see happen in your community? So we want, you know, the, the movement to really grow from each community. What was interesting around the, uh, that series of conversations is that uh, there were lots of different patterns that came up in the conversation. The one piece that was common to all the roundtable conversations was around food skills. That is really the piece that is seeming to engage lots of people right now. Otherwise, you know, one community was talking about um, doing community gardens that they haven't started to do, to be involved in community gardens, so that was their uh, interest. Uh, another one was not trying to, to create uh, um, a local farmer's market. So we saw different ideas coming up, but food skills was really reiterated throughout uh, those roundtable conversations. Um, so by doing this kind of work from the ground up, we are seeing that uh, you know we're hearing different champions coming um, from different areas, and that makes the model much stronger. So that's how you know we started to to establish that particular model, and uh, we feel that it will be much more of a sustainable model in the long term. Um, so. I think several years ago, we got together to talk about, we were focusing at that time on community gardening and you know, why had, it has been working. So we did kind of a ta historical timeline going back to the 80s. And one person in the group said, you know, really, we're not growing plants. I mean, seeds they just want to plant, grow you know, uh, on their own. You just give them a little bit of soil and water. What we are growing are really relationships. And that is what we're seeing throughout the work that we're doing. Um, not only community gardens, but in other community uh, food initiatives. Um, by uh, building uh, relationships, we're also creating uh, new, um, uh, new connections within communities. And that was very visible as we were doing the uh, roundtable conversation. Um, interestingly enough, people you know, may have known each other, uh, but they didn't know each other in light of food. So, um, you know, so st they started to, to create more connections. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, yes, okay. I, no, but I, I know I tend to uh, talk a lot. So, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. I was hoping that there had been a, a clock. Right now, there's an yeah. yeah. So, um, connections are, are really being developed. And actually, what I want us to do is to find a way to put that as an indicator. You know, if we're seeing a, a growth in connections and in partnerships, we're starting to see uh, things happening um, that multiply. So the image here is an image of really a whole uh, area and how we want to build those connections throughout the, uh, the region. Uh, another key ingredient, we have to be flexible. So uh, again, you know, we have some ideas of the model, we have pillars and we, have, we are building principles, but at the same time we know that we have to find a way for each community to, to see what would work for their own uh, context. Um, well, you know, hard to, to talk about 
um, food initiatives without talking about funders, because without any funding, um, none of that work can really happen uh, to any extensive uh, way. So we are right now, the YW has received a, a trillion, Ontario Trillium uh, Foundation uh, grant, and that's how we're doing this work. We have also been supported by uh, healthy communities. Right now we're engaging in doing a, um, an evaluation framework for the project, and that's, that has been through healthy communities. And uh, we also receive a fund from uh, Care Cash, and I'll tell you more about that when uh, I get to another slide. So access to healthy food is indeed um, at the core of our work. And uh, as Carolyn has mentioned, we're really um, engaging in this work from a food system kind of approach. Uh, we are also have been supporting particularly people living on low income in having access to, to healthy food, but we're also seeing this project as a whole community project. Um, we have really wanted to find a way to, to build relationships with local farmers, and we have lots of local farmers um, uh, in our region, so we're trying to see how we can build those connections with people who have the least access to food, and farmers who are also living often on low income. So how do we do that? Um, uh, particularly because, as you all know, we see food, or our whole society sees food as a commodity. And as soon as you see food as a commodity, it shifts how you know, um, everything is organized. So we try to change that particular perception. Um, so community gardens uh, are a vibrant part of our work. And uh, as I was mentioned before, we have lots of gardens. Uh, that have been growing. Uh, locally in the city, we've had the chance to uh, create a community garden uh, policy, so that has also been an impetus, yeah, I think I can say that, um, um, around uh, community gardening. Um, but what we've been doing uh, starting in May is we, start, we thought, okay, so we have all those ideas around this model. What can we, um, you know, is it, are they just ideas or do they make sense? So we started what we called a taste of nourish in partnership with the church. And uh, through this uh, pilot project, what we've been doing um, are uh, cooking sessions. So for instance, today there's a cooking session happening in that uh, setting. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, an example, I mentioned Care Cash being a funder. So Care Cash gave us some funding to create uh, market coupons. So in terms of the, those cooking sessions, for instance, what we have done is that we brought people to the local market and everyone has a chance to go around the market, see what's in season, and then there's a facilitator who then buys ingredients at the market, and then everyone goes together to the church and cooks together, and then eat together, and uh, every participant gets coupons, $10 worth of coupons, uh, to go and shop at the market whenever they want. And we are just in the process of doing the evaluation of this week, and it's really... That's your timer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we're gonna do that <laughs> so, I, so I'm just going to say, um, and then just going to this uh, slide. So, what we're really trying to say is that we're embracing our whole region and trying to find a way to connect all the region to those pillars and through those principles and see then what comes out of that. Uh, we don't have yet you know, the whole model uh, defined, but what we're seeing definitely are positive steps in that, uh, in that process. So we are particularly interested in hearing from anyone who's doing some work you know, similar to that uh, to see how we can uh, learn from other people's experiences. So thank you so much. So Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So we're going to have a chance for questions for, from this great presentation, but I'm going to ask Heather to come up okay. and uh, we'll hear her uh, wonderful information and then we can have some time for uh, full discussion. So if you have questions, write them down. So if you're like me, you'll forget by the time we get to questions. And uh, yeah, that's good. Good Great, one. thank Perfect. you. Excellent. 
So my name is Heather Toma, and I'm here uh, on behalf of Notre Dame Tech Health Center, which is on Manitoulin Island. And um, sorry, we had three other people that were potentially going to be here presenting with me: Julie Rochefort, who's a dietitian at Notre Dame Tech. Um, so Notre Dame Tech works with the seven First Nations communities across Manitoulin, um, and then Joseph LeBlanc, who works with the um, Mishinabiaski Nation, which covers two-thirds of the province of Ontario, is 49 First Nations communities. Um, so he's been offering uh, input to this presentation, but also wasn't able to be here today. And Carmen Pinamonquat um, from the uh, Whitefish River First Nation has been part of our Good Food Box program that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and she, so we've had lots of people with health issues, so I just, <laughs> in the healthy communities context, we're all doing a lot of really good work and how do we keep ourselves healthy so that we can keep doing that, so. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm the coordinator of the Good Food Box program um, on Manitoulin and also an organic farmer um, myself. So I've been on Manitoulin Island for 10 years, um, came originally as a farmer um, running a CSA project uh, growing organic vegetables and uh, but also doing education and community development work along the side with that and realized that um, the actual hands-on farming was important but other people were also doing that and so I've shifted now into doing more of the, the community development and education work fully. The pendulum sort of went all the way to one end and now I'm sort of trying to find this happy medium and balance realizing that actually the hands-on work and gardening is really important too, so how do we put these different pieces together? How do I do that? So this is one of the ways um, that I've been doing that, is working with, let's see, what are we doing with this? There we go. Um, the, so Northern Rural Good Food Box Program um, and the Manitoulin Child Poverty Task Force. Um, so we began our, uh, oh, that's all of that. There we go. Um, so as has been said, there's, there's a balance between the, the urban and the rural um, issues and contexts in Ontario. Um, so, okay. All right, so we're here in Toronto, and Manitoulin Island is here. Are people mostly familiar with Manitoulin? And this is considered Northern Ontario, right? <laughs> that's when people think of Manitoulin, they think that's Northern. Um, we're not that far away. And we're in a, right? So, um, so we work quite closely with Sudbury, which is here, but then we're also part of a Northern Good Food Box network, which you may be interested in. Others who have Good Food Box initiatives that they already have or wanted to have. I know, right, that's what I was going to say. So the, the, um, the Northern Good Food Box initiative that we're part of, this is my uh, high-tech pointer here. Um, so it's part of, so Sudbury, North Bay, Timmins, you're near Timmins, right? Okay, so they're near Timmins. Thunder Bay, um, and then Kenora is up here. And then um, Joseph LeBlanc uh, with, uh, with NAN, Mishinabiaski Nation, is based out of Thunder Bay, but he's working, NAN covers all of this territory here, and so all the way up to Hudson Bay. Um, and one of the primary uh, programs that they're working with is in Fort Albany, which is here at the mouth of the Albany River, um, and they have a good food box program that's bringing food from Toronto, from Food Chair, um, by truck, and then by train, and then by plane to Fort Albany. So when we talk about urban issues, and then rural, and then remote, right? So there, there are lots of different contexts to be able to think about, and so I'll bring in a little bit of that perspective from Joseph and Fort Albany and, and what they're working with, um, but primarily I'll focus on Manitoulin since that's primarily what I've been working with. But if people are interested in that Northern Good Food Box Network, um, let me know and we can hook you in. We do teleconferences a few times a year and have an email network. Um, so, um, so yeah, so rural versus remote versus urban and that there's a lot of, like you were saying, lessons that we can all be learning from each other even though our contexts are different, some of the principles are um, so Manitoulin itself, um, if people aren't familiar with the scale of it or the size, is 160 kilometers long, so it's about two hours 
to drive from end to end. And so when we say we have a, a Manitoulin good food box, there we have seven different communities currently that are a part of that. Um, and it's primarily the First Nations communities right now that are working with it. Um, but we're, it's one good food box program, but it's serving seven different communities that are up to two hours apart from each other. So again, the transportation and distances and access is, is a challenge, um, but it also allows a lot of collaboration between all those communities. So, um, so, right. so Jabotsing First Nation is the furthest west um, of the communities. The First Nations communities, Melbourne Bay, is a little bit further. Um, but in terms of the Good Food Box, Shabasing is our furthest west community that's participating, and then Wikwamakong is the furthest east, and everywhere in between. So, um, have a lot of collaboration and a lot of driving. Mm -hmm. So the, our Good Food Box program came out of the Manitoulin Child Poverty Task Force, um, and that's a wide range of different, primarily staff people working with agencies and organizations, but also community members who are retired teachers, ministers, parents, um, other school employees, and um, really all wanting to focus on this question about, about children and nutrition and food security and um, realizing that focusing on kids as was one way that's really been able to draw a lot of people together. Um, and so we um, have also this, a very strong partnership in this group between the First Nations and non-First Nations partners. It's something on Manitoulin over time that generally initiatives have been either First Nation or um, First Nation and this group in particular and these issues, it's been amazing and inspiring. Someone in one of the, the um, sessions yesterday said, if people just come back, you're excited, right? You start, you have an idea, and you think, okay, well, some of us think this is a good idea, but if people don't keep coming back, obviously it wasn't, people keep coming back, and it's this, this collaborative effort between uh, the different cultures that's been really successful around uh, these issues. Um, and so in terms of probably a lot of these statistics um, people may already be familiar with, but um, so in terms of poverty, one in 10 children um, in Canada is growing up in poverty, um, but in terms of Aboriginal children, it's one in four. Um, so the, the issues are much higher, higher and stronger. Um, and 11% of food bank users in 2012 um, were Aboriginal. Um, but they only make up 4% of the population. So again, um, there's a disproportionate uh, use there. Um, and then disproportionate, disproportionate burden in terms of nutrition-related illnesses um, with Aboriginal children. And the food insecurity in general um, for Aboriginal children is ranges. There are various different statistics, but from 21 to 83% um, food insecurity rate as compared to three to nine percent um, for a non-Aboriginal. Um, so that's, and the other thing that's very interesting as I was looking into information, the UN um, has a, um, HDI, Health Development Index, I think is what that stands for, and Canada is ranks 11 of the countries in the world, and the Aboriginal population in Canada ranks 73. So it's, um, we know those things, but it just, it's a little bit of context. Um, and it's, I was surprised actually that there haven't been more sessions here connecting to First Nations populations, and I haven't been to the conference before, so I'm not sure how it is overall, and um, I'm sorry that, you know, my partners from those communities weren't able to be here, but I'm glad at least there's there's some conversation and people that are working with other. How many do have First Nations communities in their areas? Great. Okay. Good. So, um, so yeah, that's something that there may be other people that want to share perspectives from their communities on that specifically. Um, and so the Manitoulin Child Poverty Task Force, sorry, uh, originally came out of a visit by Val Teresuk. I don't know if people are familiar with her work in food security. She's based in Toronto and has done work on effectiveness or not of community food programs and realizing that we think these are good ideas but they're not always having the impact that we want them to have. And she's focused on communities in Toronto and an urban center 
but um, one of our amazing champions in, on Manitoulin invited her to come to Manitoulin and she was really interested in that because she didn't have experience in rural areas and with First Nations and so she um, came and spoke for a day from her perspective and then we had a huge community dialogue about what was happening locally and that's that momentum has been carried into this organization. So if you are interested, she or people that are working with her, there are lots of researchers at U of T um, Public Health that are doing amazing work. And if you're looking for a way to generate conversation and dialogue, those folks um, have a lot of knowledge that they could bring to a conversation. Um, and so we just continued the momentum out of that um, about three years ago and have been meeting monthly around these food security issues. Um, and it's coming back so that's good and so one of the initial ideas was a good food box program just sort of because it's what everybody does you know was kind of initially that was one of the things on the list that seemed like it would be an easy thing to do but we realized that well maybe maybe that is doesn't make sense for us so we really sort of slowed it down and looked at what are the interests what are the needs and spent about a year meeting and understanding what everybody was doing in the different communities and what the questions were and then after a year, we realized, okay, yes, that is what we want to do. But we sort of we took our time to get to that, to get to that um, choice. Um, so there had been conversations for about ten years with other groups within the First Nations communities individually, within the churches, um, within a broader community food network that we had started as well, um, saying, okay, maybe this is a good idea. But to get the resource together, the volunteer capacity, the organization, the logistics, it just hadn't been able to come together to bring a good food box program to Manitoulin. Um, and so what we finally realized when we got this group together was that if we start collaborating with Sudbury, which is a larger urban center that already has a program running, rather than trying to start ourselves, that maybe we start that way for our pilot and then we see how we can develop it ourselves after. So that's another strategy if you're a smaller community and you live within reach of a larger community, a way to start. So that's where we're at now. Um, is Sudbury is packing the boxes for us, organizing the volunteers there, and we have 80 boxes per month out of Sudbury's 150 to 200 that they do that are being delivered to Manitoulin, already packed and ready to go. So this that's the stage we're at now. We've started in May um, working that way. Um, and so from the Child Poverty Task Force, people that were already at the table, we just opened it up to any of those agencies who wanted to participate in the program. And we realized that to start as an agency-based program, even though that's not the, the ideal of the Good Food Box is that it's open to anyone, but we knew we didn't have the logistical coordinating capacity to take $100,007 checks from everybody in the community. So we said, okay, we'll just start for this pilot. People will order through a health center or through the food bank or through an agency that already exists and that makes it easier at this pilot stage to, to get going. And seven agencies said yes. Um, and then I started as the coordinator, but we also have a point person in each of those communities or agencies that is handling it for their own community. Um, so it's a shared process of, of partnership there. Um, and transportation is really one of the key issues and so we have found volunteer drivers to bring the, the food boxes once a month to drive the two hours each way to Severy, um, organizing through churches and Lions Clubs um, and community volunteers to do that. Um, and then the community point person in each of the seven communities arranges the transportation from one spot on Manitoulin to their community. Mm -hmm. And then there's a transportation from the central location in that town to the homes. And sometimes that's done by a coordinator and other times it's a collaboration between families themselves. So it's, it's a long journey. Um, we have a church that's um, donating the space for the distribution and drop-off in Little Current, which is at the northeast corner of the island, so that's the closest point from Sudbury, and then everything goes out from there. Um, and then, yeah, so the drivers come up to an hour and a half each way, just to Little Current, to pick up and take back to their communities. Um, and then there are volunteers in each community that facilitate the distribution once it gets back to the community. 
Yeah, so we have about 80 boxes per month right now, and the reason why we started with that number is because we thought that's what we can manageably actually transport from Sudbury. So that's two vans full, packed full of boxes, and we just thought that's, we'll start there and go from there. But we already have had a lot of interest. Um, we know that it could be double that tomorrow if we were to put it out there, but right now we have 80 boxes per month. Um, and some of the communities, it goes to the same family every month, and in other communities, it's working through Ontario Works, um, the disabilities program, the diabetes programs, different wellness programs, so that in May, it goes to these 15 families, and in June, it goes to a different 15 families in that same community, so they're sort of rotating it around so that the impacts you know, are spread out over more community members. It varies from community to community how they've decided to do that. Um, and we've definitely had, we've tried to do, we did an initial baseline um, survey in terms of people's eating habits, and um, then we've tried to do an interim survey just recently, and from what we've gotten back so far, there's absolutely um, appreciation and need and um, good response to the project, especially for kids and for seniors. The, the population on Manitoulin is much higher than proportionate in terms of, of seniors, and so that's the other thing, that the small boxes that have a smaller number of food have gone um, very much to, to seniors in addition to, to kids. So, um, and, yeah. so the, the volunteer transportation has definitely been um, one of the challenges. We originally, so our plan was to have a pilot phase for six months that works through this project with Sudbury, and then during that time we're now working to see how can we base it on Manitoulin so that we don't have to do this transportational logistics. Um, we haven't found funding yet for a coordinator position, and that, that that's what we need to have before we can actually base it on Manitoulin. Um, but again, the transportation is really one of the keys, which still will be, even if we base it on Manitoulin, unless we find more volunteers to provide transportation within Manitoulin itself. Um, that's, it's just an ongoing challenge. Um, so I think there are some, we, we have an aging at home van. I don't know if other communities have that, but um, to facilitate seniors to stay in their homes longer, and that's one um, option for transportation, and also the DSAB, um, District Social Services Board has a couple of vans that they use for transportation for Ontario Works clients, and so they've offered um, at times that we can use that as well, but so we're looking at that transportation and how we can do that with the distances. Um, and in terms of the payments, so right now about half of the families that are receiving the boxes are paying for the boxes themselves. They pay the health center. The health center does a bulk payment, and then the families make their payments to the staff at the health center or the community agency. The other half, that agency or community um, service is actually paying for the boxes and the community's just decided within their internal process which they wanted to do. Um, and the, the agencies that are paying, I think it just is getting the project going and people are able to value it and experience who, other, who otherwise might not have, but there's a question as to whether that can be maintained long term and how do we look at at that funding long term for it to be sustainable. Um, in terms of coordination, it would be interesting for others that already have projects to know how that coordination is happening. Often it seems to be a staff person from an agency that just adds, that's part of their job description. Um, and we had about 15 people around the table um, from various agencies and groups and everyone said, you know, that's part of why it hadn't happened so far, is there wasn't anybody that could take that on in addition to their additional work, um, and so it's taken years to find a way to make it happen. Um, so what we're doing now, um, Nojuan Tag Health Center initially um, put in some support because they're working with all seven First Nations and they knew that it would benefit all of the communities that, that they're working with. Um, but we did, we got a SPARC grant two years ago, I guess, just for the initial conversations and the initial momentum. Um, but that's for the advocacy and not for the ongoing program um, program costs. Um, so what we've done now is each of the communities that's participating has just put in $200 for at least a small stipend to cover it for a year. 
so that we actually can have the coordinator that took over after I initially started it was working, she knew she'd be working on a volunteer basis to start, but that we would be looking for funding as we went along. And so we have this stipend that will just be a small honorarium basically for a year. Um, but again, we still need to look at what are the sustainable ways to do that. Um, so like I said, we're, we're looking to see how we can base the program on Manitoulin so that we can serve more people um, and have less transportation. We have two local grocers that have agreed um, that they want to, to provide us the wholesale cost of food once a month. They're happy to do that. Um, but the cost is going to be higher. Their wholesale price that they get, because we're more remote, is higher than the wholesale prices that Sudbury um, is getting in the larger urban area and because the numbers, the amount that we'd be purchasing is slightly less, the volume is less, so the costs are higher. So we're looking right now into those details in terms of how, you know, the pros and cons of that. And we would either have to find more money, ask more money, or raise the price or provide less food per month. So we're looking at those. Um, working with local farmers, we already have started, so we just started in May. This is our first you know, summer and fall season. Um, we, our goal this year was to have October box be all local food. We thought, okay, that's a time of year that we can think about doing this. So we talked with the farmers in May and said, this is what we want to work towards. They said, okay, we'll keep that on the back of our minds. Um, but with the cold spring and then all the rain in the fall and frost came early and all these things. And so we really, you know, we had a little bit of garlic and a little bit of lettuce and that was all that we could bring together. We have four farmers markets on the island. and. Um, a good number of local farmers, but everybody's sort of at that subsistence level at this point. So we're looking as we take it forward for next year and beyond, what are the ways to do that? And that's one of the things I'd like to talk more with you guys about, um, because the costs then are higher than the industrial food, but the quality is higher and it's supporting the local economy and it's supporting the farmers, and so how do we do that? So that's a question. Um, the Kids Can Grow program um, is a school-based project that I'm working with where we're planting seedlings and starting school gardens in schools and then the kids are selling at the farmers markets so it's kind of a, a full circle program and so part of that harvest will also be going towards the good food box um, a portion of that and then I've had community members ask can we start a grow a row program that will support the good food box so that backyard gardeners would contribute food as well um, so that will be happening next year for sure well right in, in theory I guess for sure mm -hmm. as sure as it can be um, so there is so much that goes into this good food box coordination and really it is the it's when you have your three categories it's the emergence and emergency hopefully temporary situation right that we hope it will be not something that people will need on an ongoing basis um, and so what are the other community food security aspects that we can look at. So we are doing gleaning. Um, we just started that this year as well um, because there are so many fruit trees on the island and so we had four different um, farms that we went to this year. We had issues with quality of the apples, things that I would be happy to eat but that we weren't, we weren't able to actually use for the good food box because of concerns about quality of food. So looking at cooking workshops to use some of that that could be cooked if it can't be eaten straight but that even there were some that you know, we said, no, we can't use that at all. So there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that gleaning and then how much comes out of it. That's more volunteer coordination and another whole project, but it's a piece of it. Um, and then backyard gardens and school gardens. We currently, we have three school gardens that have started in, over various years. One in conjunction with the food bank um, and two others in conjunction with this Kids Can Grow program that the school garden has been the next step. And so those are other things that we'll be looking at how that can integrate in the future. There we go. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I think uh, we'll just do a very open concept um, to throw questions. I'm sure you guys are good with that. You're okay with that? Answer all the questions. So hands up. And we certainly have the answers. Yeah, for yeah. sure. The stuff that people want to share to add to the information by all means. I'll just say one more thing. Yeah, yeah Bridget, so you spoke about your food mapping. We put together a community food security directory um, that has all those resources, the community kitchens, the local farmers markets, farms, nutrition programs, 
and it's online at No Joint Tag Health Center. So it's like, I forgot the handouts, but No Joint Tag Health Center. This is the bill. So if you're looking for a model of doing that, and then also healthy eating guidelines, um, that was another SPARC grant um, that we're using in the community for schools, arenas, restaurants. And we brought a couple of um, resources about our Nourish program, and then also our Food and Peterborough website, and Nourish, so help yourselves as well if you're interested. Great. Yes, I also have a question. Um, is your, would your presentation be available online? So all the presentations, as far as I know, unless the presenters have said no, but they're all going to be on the HC Link website, yeah, after. We just didn't do it before, just like, obviously, <laughs> we're seeing before, but everything will be up on the website, and uh, you're actually going to be sent a link. Yeah. Um, do you guys all see the local food fund as being potentially supportive to your projects? If you didn't have to have 50% cash to be matched by the Ontario Local Food Fund, it would be easier. <laughs> but it's a 50% cost share program, so you have to have 50% to apply. Um, so it's a little more challenging, and certainly, you know, we've talked about uh, you can dream, right? And there certainly are things like we have a really strong food, just food box program, and so there is income from that and income from things, but it is certainly a barrier. And it can't be, if you look at the details, it can't be matched by other mm -hmm. provincial things. <laughs> I was so, going to say, yeah, so trillion, yeah. green yeah. belt, red, um, yeah, lots, so there are some barriers with that. Question? Yeah. How much is a food box for your group? How much is it a, a month for it? Sorry, $17 for the large box and eight for the small box. And they got it weekly. Monthly. Sorry, eight for Okay, monthly. Yeah. And, oh, sorry. We also have a food box program called Just Food. And uh, it's twice a month, so we have a staple box and we have a fresh produce box. So, fresh produce box, uh, the large is $20. And it's not full price, but it's also you can have a subsidy, and we don't ask you know, people to pay what they can. So the subsidy is ten dollars, and the small is twelve dollars for the price, or six dollars. Can you guys put that in the back of your presentation? Mm -hmm. And maybe we should have exactly yeah. got that. To, to, yeah, that would be helpful. If you go actually on, uh, on your website, Nourish, you, right there? you would okay. see Okay, great. Our website is amazing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's totally inspiring. Thank you. And, and we're certainly looking, we're excited about some uh, potential new models with our, with, with just food as well. And uh, I don't think we're officially allowed to say, but uh, uh. <laughs> through, um, through, our, through the health unit as a lead with student nutrition programs in Peterborough City and County, we've, um, we're just about to enter a contract with the Greenbelt Fund. Um, around their broader public sector because it's an easy way. Our, our health unit has direct uh, link with our 46 student nutrition programs. And so we've, uh, we've got a dream about um, a school just food box program that would look at uh, uh, healthy, affordable, local food into our breakfast program. So we're just at the, the very beginning stages of that, but uh, uh, it's, it's a perfect opportunity to look at uh, getting local food easily distributed and healthy food easily distributed into school breakfast programs that are based on community volunteers who don't have time to be shopping with specials every single week, but then also building capacity for um, the Just Food program as well. And um, so we work with a lot of local farmers. Yeah. Um, so, and with, it's interesting that we're doing an outreach and a lot of people say, you know, that's the only way I can access local food which was part of the reason why we wanted to do this uh, Nourish Coupon, so that people, we started to create no, uh, other opportunities for people to access uh, local food. So that's, uh, and then the other piece that we've done when it takes a Nourish is to do a uh, cooking out of the box workshop. So to increase the impact of participating in the food box program. And we don't want to let people see that as a, you know, it's open to anyone, so we don't see that as uh, just for people living on low income. Mm -hmm. um, but we really see it as a, a, another, you know, just like CSE, and another way to participate in the economy of the economy. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. In terms of the local food, did you find that the local he will get your question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to look at Because for us, it definitely feels like the price 
purchase from the local farmers is higher than as a bulk purchasing um, from the grocery stores or the warehouses. So how were you able to fund that? Is this a question of scale, or do you have extra well, funding? So for us, it was really important to work with local farmers and to pay farmers a fair price. So we end up doing a lot of fundraising work in order okay. to be able to do that. Yeah. So that's external fundraising, and that's part of the staff, the coordinator position that's paid Okay. And then because we are out of the wider industry, um, so we are also agency uh, for uh, activities. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> no, I just I find this all all of the the initiatives that are going on is fascinating. It's just amazing, and to see the difference too between rural and remote, like that's even more interesting. You know, when you really think about it, yeah, there's there's that whole transportation coordination coordination piece that you are all talking. I just, I just wonder, like, if you, um, what are the other options around transportation? Because that, that's a really key, right? Like, are, are they able to partner with any, any businesses? They can even put curators all over the place. <laughs> um, <laughs> FedEx. I don't know. Like, those kinds of partners yeah. uh, that might be interested or vested in, in offering up some of this. Yeah. So what we researched for that, because Manitou would transport these based on Manitou. Yeah. 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 trucks on my but it's a question of the scheduling because there's fresh, perishable food in the middle of winter. It's minus 30, and they couldn't offer anything that didn't have to sit overnight. Um, and so they would have been willing to give us a discounted rate, um, but they weren't able to. It didn't, yeah. doesn't work logistically because they don't get there that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Curator is an option, but that would have been a full cost. We weren't able to get the discounted rate for that. What we have been doing is working with Eat Local Sudbury, which is an amazing model for a regional food co-op. Um, they've been very um, collaborative with us, and they have a van. Um, so my farm and four other farms on Manitoulin are providing products to Eat Local Sudbury. So they do delivery for the farm products, and so they're now helping us with the delivery for the good food box from Sudbury to Manitoulin. But they've had to rent a U-Haul trailer in order to do that, but they've agreed for the time being that they will do that just to, again, sort of to keep it going another six months, say, while we look for other options. Um, but again, it's the logistics of the perishable food that is a higher cost, more delicate product to be able to transport. Um, it's, it's possible, but it just, it takes more protective, you know, it's delicate. And how long would it take? For Hudson Bay, they are able to do it in two days the way that they, because they set it up themselves. Um, the specific that Joseph is amazing in terms of his, he's so mellow and just so persistent that he makes these things happen. Um, but yeah, so it's two days for it to get there. Normally through normal channels, it's like a week. Yeah. Um, I forgot my other handout, but there's a video. If you go to the Sustain Ontario website and they have a growing good food ideas link and they have all these videos and they have three from those northern remote communities and um, I can't think of what it's called but it's about the Fort Albany farmers market um, and there's a video about what it takes to get that food from food share in Toronto up to Fort Albany and it talks about the impacts because they've sent out a mark uh, set up a market they're based on that food coming in. That's their farmer's market, is this food coming from food chair um, that's such higher quality than what they can get in the northern store, um, and much lower price. It's $24 for a 10-pound bag of potatoes um, from the northern store. That's their daily food access, versus the, their good food box is nine items, and it's $80, which is way more than we would think was sustainable, but for them, it's half the price of what that food would cost at their store. So again, every context is totally different and what it's looking at what we can do. Yeah. So I did have questions about some transportation stuff that you might have answered it, but then also as you're talking about rural and remote, yeah. um, and because you're working with Aboriginal populations, how much are you doing or how much is being done or that you may or may not be aware of yeah. revitalizing um, traditional food systems? Uh, on Manitoulin, there's a lot happening. Um, we haven't linked that directly with the Good Food Box, but there's 
um, much more teaching of food skills, especially in Wicomacon, which is the largest First Nation on Manitoulin. They have quite a bit of funding and quite a bit of momentum going right now around the fishing, hunting, gathering, um, and those foods. And within NAN, with the northern communities, um, that's very much a part of what they're doing. And one of the other videos that's on the Sustained Link is about the, again, I can't remember the fancy name for the video, but it's about the, the fishing and forestry foods that are coming in. So there's there's a lot happening in the far north and also on Manitoulin. And one of the things that I did a couple years ago was coordinate a cross-cultural local food festival. So we had the local farmers and what you would sort of traditionally think of, but then we had the traditional foods and speakers and um, stories and practices. And so we had a day-long festival and symposium that linked, that brought the two together. And that was from an OIFE grant. Um, for food education, there we go. Um, and that was, again, hugely, hugely well responded to in the community, and we should do another one soon. Well, we get all that time yeah. on our hands. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hate to be, oh, go ahead. Let's wait. Yeah, just touching quickly on the participation of partnerships between the Indians and non Indians. I mean, this morning we heard about the French majority, but then the interaction with the English majority. Yeah. But in your case, how, how, how did that work? It works. Yeah, it works really well, and that's at the beginning I was saying that um, often on Manitoulin things are quite segregated, but with these food and family and food issues, there's been amazing collaboration that's been happening with how, these products. How do you manage to reach out beyond the native community? It's, I mean, there's a really strong local food movement, so I'm an organic farmer, so I've been involved from the farming perspective, but then also from the food security perspective, so I guess it's me, maybe I'm one of the links between the two because I had worked in both communities, but it, the interest is just there. So it was just, I mean, making phone calls and talking to people and saying, do you want to come? And then they came back. So I, and I'm um, just, you know, finding, I guess finding the people who are interested in the issues in each of the communities and finding one person and then it spreads from there. And in Peterborough County, we have two First Nations, Hiawatha and Curve Lake, and uh, I think we're still, our Board of Health is still a bit of an anomaly that we have a representative for each of our First Nations communities on our Board of Health, and so we have, that opens the door for more partnerships and working with the community, with the First Nations Health Centers, um, and, and then that then translates into partnerships like with the YW and the Just Food Program. But I think it comes down to, that food brings people together, and uh, um, we've been really fortunate that we've had funding to support a, a basic food skills program called Come Cook With Us, which uh, has been you know, quite popular in our First Nations communities to bring people together around basic food skills and then transition um, into collective kitchens um, and that sort of thing. So we have a, a Lovesick Lake First Nations, which is a, for off reserve. First Nation, and so they've really, um, the young mums and, uh, have really embraced that and actually have collective kitchens happening on their own now, which is fabulous. So I think it's that power of food. Yeah, I think it is. And the health issues too, maybe. Yeah. The, 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 the urgency the, yeah, yeah. of the health issues that people are, they know that they want to do something and this is something that feels tangible. Yeah. That they can actually see something happening. and. You know, we have yet to see what the long-term impacts of that are going to be, but in the short term, it's, you know, it's a step that yeah, people actually and, really and, like and I think it's those partners around health that we have the Southern Ontario Aboriginal mm -hmm. Diabetes Program that has really focused, done a lot of focus in the last maybe two years in, in Peterborough City and County. So again, we've been able as, a, mm -hmm. as an organization to connect with someone who's already connected with our, with our First Nations community. So, it just makes it easier where we can come in and support uh, and learn as well. Perfect. So I don't want you guys to be late for lunch. That would be the last of the group. So we want to thank our presenters. So, well, thank you, Carolyn and Heather. Thank you so much. Voting, or the voting, the evaluation again with the flip charts um, at the back. The stickers are just stuck where the markers usually go. So you can just grab a sticker and put it on. I will hand that in. Uh, also, a reminder that the walk, um, 
Friendly awards are at 12.30 during lunch, so if you're reading down here, you can see them. It's the first provincial one, so uh, it'll hopefully motivate us for next time. And that the sessions start again at 1 o'clock, and you're right in your breakout room at 1 o'clock, not the big room.